Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Miss Michelle Eisen, Starbucks barista and Starbucks Workers United organizer. Now let me say this before we get into the interview. Naturally, Starbucks presents itself as a progressive business. However, when it comes to some actual progressive policies, they tend to be quite corporate and maybe even more restrictive than many. Let's talk about all of it. Ms. Eisen, good day. Thank you for being on Indisputable. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's get right into it. You are a barista at the um, Elmwood Avenue Starbucks, that's in Buffalo, New York. Um, you help organize the first unionization or unionized Starbucks store. There's an opportunity uh, for individuals to testify about what this all means and how this has impact to the labor force. But there's an issue. So give us what's happening at Starbucks now. Um, well, what's happening currently is them continuing to fight this union effort tooth and nail to the point of blatantly breaking US labor law to do it. Um, and what is going on currently is that uh, Bernie Sanders has asked for a hearing uh, with the health committee and he's asked our current CEO, interim CEO, founder, whatever you'd like to call him, Howard Schultz, to come and testify and, and answer some questions about the company's behavior in the last 18 months. And um, to nobody's surprise, Howard has declined the invitation. Um, and so there's a lot of talk right now about the potential of using subpoena power to have him come in and testify anyway. What is your thinking about the reasoning he would not offer testimony? And I say this because while he was the CEO or at least active, he talked a lot. He talked a lot. He went on news stations often. He went to colleges and provided sit down lectures. He talked all the time, he even did a video series and just posted it online of him talking. Why do you think now he doesn't wanna talk? Well, I mean, he certainly loves to talk. You are not incorrect there. What he doesn't like to do is, is answer for his actions or the actions of the company. And what's going to happen in this hearing, should he be you know, brought in to testify is he'll have to answer some very serious questions. It's, it's kind of fascinating because I've, I've been with the company 12 years. I've had a lot of um, Howard exposure, if you'd like to call it that. And uh, he's constantly saying, you know, we don't need a union at this company because the workers already have a voice. But anytime he's ever been put in a position to talk to workers face to face in a way, in a form that isn't controlled by him, um, he he flees or he finds a way to to deny the workers their opportunity to have those conversations. And in this situation, especially a hearing like this, he doesn't, he won't have anywhere to go. You know, he'll be forced to answer some some very um, serious questions about some very serious behavior on behalf of the company and himself. And I think that's scary. One of the most shocking stats to me is this, the NLRB, has issued over 65 official complaints against Starbucks, encompassing over 1300 violations. That by way of statistical comparison, makes Starbucks one of the worst violators of federal law in American history. How has that never become a story? You know, it's a, it's a very good question. Just. Two days ago here in Buffalo, we got the the um, ruling on the very big ULP unfair labor practice hearing that happened here over the summer. And it was a staggering 204 page decision from this ALJ and shocking. I mean, when you read what, what came of this investigation and this hearing, you can't look at this company and call them progressive. You can't look at Howard and say you're, you're the founder of a company and CEO of a company that's taking care of its workers. You're abusing your workers at every possible turn as soon as they say the word union or organized. Um, I don't know why the media ha has been so afraid to focus on that. You would think that this would be a huge, you know, if anything, a huge media hit. But it's very clear that 
you know, you don't want to anger the supposed progressive company, right? Um, it's just really from the inside out, it's not a progressive company. I mean, you hit the nail on the head at the beginning yeah. of the introduction. They are, they're anything but. Let's talk about some of the nuances in protocol management, etc. Uh, you've been with the company for a very long time. You're still with the company. Yes. Okay. Now, have you seen retaliation when people do what you do? And are you in fear of the company having retaliation against you? I mean, I've witnessed retaliation uh, from the onset of this, going back to just a few days, mere days after we announced this organizing campaign back in August of 2021. We saw an onslaught of well over 100 members of corporate and upper management shipped into Buffalo to infiltrate our stores and to surveil and to intimidate workers. We were called into captive audience meetings where workers were essentially told, if you want to be paid for your shift, you have to attend this non-mandatory <laughs> meeting. Um, I mean, it was, an, it was an abuse of their power. They came in, you know, you're, you're sitting across the room from a, a the president of Starbucks North America who makes $4 million a year and you're listening to her tell you that you're both the same, that the company cares about both of you the same and you're both partners. And you know, it's really a very intimidating atmosphere to be a part of. And people suffered from it. You know, workers were calling in sick because they couldn't take the pressure of coming into work and being surveilled for their entire shift. You it shouldn't take an act of bravery to organize your workplace. You know, that it shouldn't take that. This is a right in this country, and we should have the right to execute that without fear of retaliation from, you know, our corporate overlords. Starbucks is one of the richest companies on the planet. What are they afraid of? And, and I say this in a particular context. You keep fighting this, you keep showing yourself to be antithetical to what you promote as a brand. You end up disconnecting your brand from the people who support it. You have a risk of losing way more money in the fight than you would in simply a negotiation. So why do you think they have been so hard against a common dynamic known as negotiation? Let's have a conversation. I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. We're fighting Howard Schultz's ego. Mm, I mean, that's just wow. the reality of the situation. The com- you're right, the company can absolutely afford, but it would have been more cost effective to get to the bargaining table and negotiate a contract you know, from the moment that we won back at last December. That's right. But this is his life's work, so he says. It's something he's clearly very proud of. And it can't be easy to hear that your creation, your life's work is not as good as you think it is. And so what he continues to say is our company is already so amazing. We already give a voice to our workers. We we don't need a third party, as he keeps saying. The union is a third party. And when you remind him that the union is not a third party, it's his hourly workers standing up and saying, listen, we were treated like crap in the middle of a global pandemic while you brought in billions upon billions of dollars. We'd like to have a voice in our working conditions, please. He says, "Oh, I'm giving you a voice. You've always had a voice. The reality is we've never had a voice. And as I said before, anytime there's ever been a forum to sort of initiate those conversations, He has fled, he's literally fled the room. He came to Buffalo at the end of our organizing campaign, uh, right before our vote count, where he held a big forum. And when a worker stood up and said, we wanna ask you some questions, he literally stood up and fled the room. You know, this is not a man who actually wants his workers to have any sort of voice. He wants to say that it was their voice, but it's not, it's not us. It's him or whoever else makes those calls. I remember, a lecture he gave many years ago, uh, and this was one of those sit down lectures. And he talked about how they were going into new markets in foreign countries. And he would basically hire individuals who did not look like that country, did not look like the people who resided in that nation and things would fail. And he even talked about he sent his best workers, top workers to get it going and they could not. And then he says, I had an epiphany. I needed to hire people from the country to understand the culture. And it was somebody at, I think it was executive level or management level who said, listen, you gotta do it this way because here's what they see, here's what you're doing, here's the blind spot. And he listened, did it, he makes a bunch of profit now because of it, right? So he says it in a way that makes it seem as if, 
He's always looking for that spark that says, ha, I did get it wrong and I can get it right now. I just, I'm perplexed as to why did it not happen here? This is the easy move in my opinion. This is the way you must go as a progressive company. You can't fight this part is unionization. Unionization and progressive policies go hand in hand. It's a protection of workers because people got to eat, and people got to live. Um, so I'm still perplexed by the whole dynamic. Have Has there been any conversation or movement from some executive leaders that actually agree with you? Um, I think everyone's been pretty good about falling in line. But mm. I do think that you know, just earlier this week, on the same day as that ALJ decision, and on the same day that Bernie said we might execute some subpoena power, we also had a group of white collar Starbucks workers in the headquarters in Seattle stand up and say, we're supporting these hourly workers. We don't, we don't agree with how this company is treating them or how this company is treating this movement. And we want to see a change. We want to see this company stand up and, and be the company that it attests that it is. And I'm with you. This is, you know, they have the opportunity to be the hero here, and yet they continue to be the villain. And that's kind of shocking. From from the very naive part of me who believed this was a better company when I started with them a dozen years ago, I'm waiting for that epiphany, as you call it, or as yep. Howard calls it, where he says, Oh, you know what? We made a mistake because the world will applaud them, and most yep. of them forget everything they've put us through in the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. And you got to remember the whole concept, right, for Starbucks was he brings in all of these consultants because it's in California at the onset, at the beginning. He brings in these consultants, pays them millions of dollars to look at an expansion model outside of California. They came back and said, hey, you know, we're sorry, but this. This model of you allowing people to just sit and allowing people to use Wi Fi, that model will only work in this area in California that you are already in. If you take that model and you make it national, you're going to have a problem. You're not going to be profitable. He dismissed all of their data, he dismissed it and went with his gut. And look, it's a big company now, right? But he did something out of the box. That was considered to be damn progressive, and it it was a winner. He won. Now this, this is a normative progressive value, not really out of the box. And guess what, Howard? You're losing. You're losing because I'm not going to get another Starbucks coffee until this is remedied. And I'm calling on those that support me to do the same thing. That support progressive values, do the same thing. That support people uh, like Michelle, do the same. Thing until they get the point. Michelle Eisen, thank you for your continued leadership. For those who would like to follow your continued fight to be an advocate to make Starbucks the best company it can be, how can they do so? Um, you can find us uh, SB Workers United on Twitter. Uh, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. Um, for any Starbucks worker who is watching who wants to organize their workplace. There are forms and links that you can reach out to through us. It's all anonymous. You know, we'll be able to get you started and have those conversations. We're stronger to bet together, and we're at this point over seven thousand unionized Starbucks workers in just a year and a half. Wow! So. Amazing. Um, I so appreciate leaders like you who are willing to stand up to power. Thank you for your continued service. Okay. Thank you for your time. Absolutely.